listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of Christian Medical and Dental Associations. Here's your host, Dr. Mike Chop. Well, welcome back to this week's episode of CMDA Matters. For our regular listeners, you know that we like to do a feature that we call Cameo of Courage, where we get to highlight CMDA members who are prime examples for us all when it comes to living for Christ throughout their careers in healthcare. And this week, we are featuring Dr. Rebecca Naylor. Some of you will recognize her name because of her decades of service on the mission field in the huge and highly populated country of India as that nation slowly began to close its doors to Western Christian missionaries. And I personally consider her to be a real hero of our faith. She retired last year from her position as Director of Global Health Strategies for the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. So I asked her to join me to talk about her experiences as the first woman general surgeon graduate from the Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, back in the 1970s. You're also going to hear her talk about the joy that she has experienced as she served in India and the legacy that she's left on healthcare missions and how she has continued to support the next generation of healthcare missionaries, those who are responding to the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. I wanna invite you now to listen in to our recent conversation with Dr. Rebecca Naylor. Well, today on CMDA Matters, I have a real hero of the faith, uh, someone that I've known for quite a long time as I was preparing and felt God calling me into medical missions, but someone I knew was already out there and obeying God. And that's Dr. Rebecca Ann Naylor, who graduated from Baylor University as well as Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. She went on to do a general surgical residency at Parkland Hospital in Dallas and felt God's call in her life to go into medical missions. And so she served, amazing, that uh, 50 years ago, this May, she landed on Indian soil at Bangalore Baptist Hospital and a practice of over 36 years on the field at Bangalore, involved in all sorts of on-the-field activities, including lots of patient care, administrative responsibilities, and teaching. And after her illustrious career, the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention asked her to become the Director of Global Health Strategies for the IMB. And that's how I've gotten to know Rebecca the most over these last several years since I came to CMDA. So, Dr. Rebecca Naylor, thanks for joining us today on CMDA Matters. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be with you. I've been told that medical missionaries are like the rock stars in the church today. And you represent this crop of ministry professionals with an incredible legacy and global impact for God's kingdom, a doctor who spent her entire career in service. When did that vision, that call come to you, Rebecca, and and how did it come? I grew up in the home of a, a Baptist pastor, and I heard about missions from the beginning of all memory. I came to know Jesus as my Savior when I was five years old. Convicted about sin, my parents led me to faith. I was in junior high school when I started thinking about medicine, and God put that there because I had no idea what one did to go into the field of medicine. I was 13 when some missionaries were visiting in our church, talking about international missions, and God spoke to me very clearly that medical missions was what he wanted me to engage in. I couldn't imagine that he could use somebody insignificant and small uh, (laughs) like me, but over a period of about 18 months uh, after, as I prayed and thought about it, I knew it was a reality and told God I would do it. And immediately, total peace God just gave the affirmation because all the uncertainty went away. Then I was about 15 by the time I, you know, finally said, okay, this is it. 
and told my parents. I had said nothing to anyone in those 18 months. You actually have a biography. So our listeners will have a, in our show notes today a reference to, to your biography, which is Rebecca Ann Naylor, MD, Missionary Surgeon in Changing Times. How did it come about that you ended up deciding to have a biography written by Camille? It's quite a story because, you know, I would go speak in churches like missionaries do, and people would say, well, when are you going to write your story? Well, I'd say, not now. I don't have time. Actually, Camille was a friend. We were in Baylor at the same time, but didn't really know one another. And when I had come back from India, then we became good friends. And uh, her field was creative writing, but she had never written a book. (laughs) So I just approached her. And uh, she was horrified at the idea, Uh, but finally uh, agreed, did all the research, did the writing. And I had all the years from college onward, I had written my parents long letters. Mother had kept all those. And that was the real crux of, you know, the material that she had available. Another reason that I wanted her to do it at that time was, you know, my mother and friends were getting older and and dying. And I knew that that resource was urgently needed to be addressed. Well, I'm I'm glad you did it. And I've had a chance to, to read your biography and to learn a few things about you, including a couple of very protective older brothers that you have. And uh, with some degree of reluctance, let you go 50 years ago uh, in May to India. I also, you got a lot of pictures in your book, of course. And one of those pictures that I found fascinating, you're a pioneer in many different respects, but this obligatory picture of a residency group in some year in your residency there at Parkland, massive number. I don't know if it was all general surgery or all the subspecialties together, but wow, massive group, but only one woman in the crowd. And that was Rebecca Ann Naylor. So tell, especially for our uh, physicians who are women out there uh, or other healthcare specialists who are women, tell us what it was like to be the only woman in a, a surgical residency at a time when it was pretty much a man's world. It definitely was a man's world. And, and it, you know, my medical school professors all discouraged my desire to go into surgery. I think they were quite skeptical of the whole idea. And in fact, convinced me that I probably wouldn't even get a residency. Parkland was my first choice. And evidently, they had enough confidence to try this out. They had not taken a woman before, and they did not take one the whole five years I was there, nor for five years afterwards, in oh, fact. Wow. But as is true in life, anywhere you are, you have to earn the respect of others. And uh, hard work, I worked as hard as others. I met the same standards and um, was successful. And I was so goal-oriented. I don't know, All uh, the idea of being the only woman just really didn't enter into my thinking. You're just trying to survive, you know, one day to the next. Mm -hmm. So uh, mostly I was not aware. I was finishing my third year. And one of the faculty was helping me do something, I don't remember what. And we were finishing the case. And he looked at me and he said, I do believe you're going to make it through this program. And I was so stunned that anybody doubted (laughs) after three years, after three years, you know. So, uh, you know, I had to put up with some things, and they they didn't have call rooms for girls or anything. I was with the guys all the time. Wow. It was an experience, but I think it kind of helped prepare me for (laughs) cross-cultural missions. Years later, fast-forwarding toward the end of your career, I, uh, clearly you had made your mark at Parkland, and they invited you to come back later and, t- and to teach some courses. To, I, at what level were you teaching? Med students, residents, later in your career? I was teaching both and was responsible for student education in the Department of Surgery. 
my last field years were non-residential. I was actually living in the U.S. and still uh, relating to church planting in India and making trips. So that was that was the period in which I was teaching in the Department of Surgery at the med school in Dallas, and you know thoroughly. Uh, enjoyed it. It was a, another learning <laughs> experience, but a great opportunity. So I want to ask you a question, Dr. Naylor, and it's a bit of a rhetorical question because I'm sure it's not whether or not this happened, but but how often it happened. Like over 36 years in challenging circumstances as a missionary surgeon, a leader at Bangalore, when you first felt like a day, I wow, I I think I should think about going home and and calling it quits. Now you'll maybe su- you'll surprise me and say, actually, Mike, that that never happened. But but tell us, am I wrong or am I right? You're right. You know there were there were some big challenges that you can read about them in the book. <laughs> I don't dwell on them. I think the the essence of what I should communicate to everyone is. You need to be very sure about your call to serve, and your call is dynamic. You need to re-examine it regularly, and of course, in time of crisis like that, you definitely should examine it, and it is your call that keeps you there. If you just go overseas because there's great need, there is great need, of course, you won't last and you won't stay through those bad times. And it's not circumstances that determine, you know, what from a human perspective, well, it looks logical, this is the time to go home. That's not how you figure it out. So the bottom line is God's call. And that means really close walk with the Lord to know what that is. Who did you bounce things off of? You know, I was married, my wife Pam, it seemed, and even Dr. Sturey, who started Timok Hospital, that was one of my heroes there at Timok where I served, he would say that when he was down, his wife was up and, and picked him up. Who was that for you since you were a single missionary over those 36 years? Was there someone else that would help pick you up on those days? Not really, because most of, especially the last, well, most of the years, I was entirely working with Indians. There was nobody from my own culture. And, of course, some of the crises you can't share with a national colleague, though I had very close friends and, and, you know, but there were limitations. So a lot of it went into the, the letters And I even had one friend that if there were things that I just couldn't even tell my parents because I knew they would kind of freak out, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. about, I had a friend that I could send that kind of a letter to. You know, computers weren't there. Phone was very difficult. And so I even today, I can best express myself at the feeling level in writing. What do you say to U.S. practicing, U.S.-based physicians and dentists or others that you encounter as you speak and share who say, well, you know, they don't allow me to do that kind of thing. I'm not supposed to do that kind of thing. How do you admonish them and uh, challenge them, especially those who do short-term missions and go and pray and do all kinds of things globally, but then they come back to the States, feel like, well, I'm not allowed to do that. What, What do you tell those folks, Rebecca? You can always find ways to do it. That's what I tell them. You will have conversations with patients. You will have opportunities with permission to pray with people. I came back to the medical school, and it's a government school. And, you know, you're not supposed to do these things. Well, there was another believer in the faculty in that department, and we wanted to pray together, and we thought there were other people, and and they wouldn't let us have a room So we went to the food court and had prayer meetings in front of the whole school. Uh, Nobody could prevent that. So there, there are ways to do that. I always figured even in the medical school, if a student had a problem and they're sitting in my office and I close the door and ask permission to pray, nobody can fault that. So there are always ways. 
Before we continue with this week's episode, here's a special announcement for you. Are you interested in short-term mission trips? Well, now is the time to start thinking about signing up for a global health outreach trip. GHO sends teams around the world to places like El Salvador, East Africa, India, the Pacific, Central Asia, Nicaragua, the Middle East, and many others. Through these trips, we disciple participants, grow national churches, share the gospel, and provide care to the poor and needy. Our teams minister in outpatient primary care medicine and dentistry, and in small and large hospitals to provide surgical services. If you are interested in using the skills and resources the Lord has entrusted to you, please visit cmda.org slash GHO to learn more and find a trip that works in your schedule. Education is a key component of healthcare missions. And that's why one of CMDA's mission outreach programs is Medical Education International, or MEI. It is a short-term missions program that provides academic teaching and clinical training while building relationships with local colleagues and modeling the compassion, care, and love of Jesus. MEI teams serve primarily in low- and middle-income countries, and most teams consist of two to 10 fully trained healthcare professionals. For more information, visit cmda.org slash MEI. Let's jump right back into this week's episode. Well, until recently, you have been responsible for overseeing healthcare missions outreach from the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. So I'd like you to look back, if if you wouldn't mind, a little bit about what I understand were some strategy changes maybe 40 or 50 years ago, about the time that you went to Bangalore, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, at least as it impacted sub-Saharan Africa, about how healthcare missions wasn't going to be a focus of the IMB. Has that changed since that time? And, and what do you think about that aspect of mission sending agencies and their perspective about healthcare missions as a very unique and often costly aspect with investments in uh, kingdom building. Obviously, it's a rather complicated subject, but first of all, all of us are mandated as followers of Jesus to both preach and heal. So that you're to be doing both. I think the IMB uh, has always, and even today, given correct priority to church planting making disciples and planting churches. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely right. We went through that period. Part of the reason was financial. Running mission hospitals is very expensive. And should, should your resources, your financial resources, and even your people resources be deployed more on the church planting leadership development side. There was some philosophical change, but a financial change as well. And it did affect Bangalore, where I was serving uh, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And I was actually told to sell the hospital. And we didn't sell it. Uh, It was too valuable to sell. Actually, no one could afford it. (laughs) But yes, I was directly impacted. Well, time passed. And, you know, we kind of went back toward a more middle ground. And since the late 90s, health strategies in the IMB has been back toward its rightful place. And in today, uh, it's uh, I've been 50 years with the IMB. Wow, praise God. And I, I have never seen health strategies have a more important, respected role than today. Praise God. Does it look the same as it did before that you've got all these mission hospitals? No, it doesn't look the same. And we partner with hospitals and we have missionaries in hospitals, but we are doing so many other healthcare related things all over the world. It's just exciting. And the IMB, 12%, over 12% 
of their 3,500 missionaries are healthcare trained and healthcare background. That tells you the importance. And at the IMB, we, we talk about our missionary task, entry, evangelism, making disciples, forming healthy churches, developing leaders, and exiting to partnership. And healthcare impacts every one of those things. Mm -hmm. It's key in every one of them. And the IMB leadership know that and recognize it. And it's an exciting day for healthcare missions at the IMB and, and generally. I talked to a, a number of presidents and recruiters for mission sending agencies in terms of the impact of the COVID pandemic and where the IMB is right now with healthcare, in particular healthcare missionaries and recruitment since the pandemic. Are things improving? Are you now seeing a surge in recruitment or is it still stunned as a result of the pandemic? It's increasing. And you know, one thing about the pandemic that we all need to recognize in strategy is, you know, the whole world got attuned to health. I mean, everybody's thinking about their health and a little worried about their health. And so governments, general public, all these things. And I think right now we we have a special opportunity and opening. But in recruitment and mobilization, the number of healthcare people being sent out is increasing for the IMB. Wow, that is a delight to hear. Speaking of mobilization, at least for all of this, the 21st century, it seems that we've gone from the West to the rest, clearly to from everywhere to everywhere in advancing God's kingdom. And how have you adjusted at, at the IMB to clearly a, an international multi-ethnic workforce, including within healthcare. Very wonderful uh, how we've tried to adjust. We have uh, what we call global missionary partners. And the idea is that the IMB, with its 180 years of history, can help equip our national partners to be sending entities, not financially sending the partner, but how, what do they need to do to become able to send? So we've developed, you know, materials and training. We're going all over the world training uh, national entities in how to be a sending organization and send out their own people that God calls. At the same time, for our field people, getting them trained up to what is it like to have a multi-ethnic team, a multicultural team. Mm -hmm. We were already multi-ethnic, but multicultural. And so on your team are, is this African doctor or this Cuban doctor or this whatever. And how do you all team together in the missionary task? So some of that training goes on as well. But we're totally committed. The IMB has a goal to deploy 500 global missionary partners working with IMB field teams everywhere in the world, from everywhere in the world. Wow. Would you talk with us a little bit about God's call today on young healthcare trainees, including students and residents and fellows, with respect to the idea of, for them, avidly looking for mentors uh, who will disciple them and encourage them on the path, the same path that you walked 50 years ago or, or more, sensing God's guidance into full-time missions? I think there's several things that, that our young people who are maybe college, maybe med school, graduate school, or residency need to be thinking about. First of all, you do need to be a good steward of your educational opportunity and be as well prepared as you can. The other, another thing is this is the time, really be very sure that your spiritual disciplines are in place, your time in God's word, your prayer time, fellowship with other believers in a local church. These are all things that need to be in place. And you, you think you're busy, well, I assure you, you will get busier. Mm -hmm. So put it in place now. Be active in sharing your faith even now with classmates or 
whoever is in your world. And then, um, you know, reading missionary biographies, it meant so much to me. From childhood, I was reading them. But even as a young adult, it was significant to read missionary biographies, see what they did, how did God call them, how did God speak to them, you know, just how God used an ordinary person to do whatever it was he had them to do. So missionary biographies are important. Wherever you are right now, you will have cross-cultural opportunities. Now in even a smaller city in the U.S., you've got cross-cultural opportunities. Look for those. It may be if you're in university, you've got them on your campus. But in your town, ways to volunteer, ways to make friends and share the gospel cross-culturally. You can do that right now as you prepare. And all these things are important. Mentors are important. You may have more than one for different areas of your life, a missionary mentor. Now with, with our digital world, you know, it's not like you have to be face-to-face or you have to write letters. You can do it virtually. A mentor who's very effective in sharing the gospel can model and help you so much in growth. Mentors, you know, to help you with spiritual growth, um, spiritual disciplines. God can lead you to those people if you ask him. And are you currently taking new mentees? Because uh, those who are listening to this podcast, how can they reach out to you if they want to maybe maybe they get your book and, and want to actually be mentored by one of the greats? How could they do that? I'm happy to communicate or correspond however I can to help anybody. There's a verse in in Psalm 71 that talks about asking God when you're old and gray that you can still proclaim him and all his great deeds to the next generation. So I'm still trying to do that. Amen. Well, Dr. Naylor, thank you for joining us today on CMD Matters and sharing your story. And what's great is uh, others can go and get your book probably on Amazon or christianbookdistributors.com or however. God bless you, Dr. Naylor. Thank you so much. You know, if you want to learn more about Dr. Naylor's career, and including some stories that she didn't have time to tell us that are in her book about how God showed up in incredible ways as she was doing patient care over the decades and all kinds of other work as a missionary surgeon in India, I want to encourage you to check out her book entitled Rebecca Ann Naylor, M.D., Missionary Surgeon in Changing Times. You can find that book online at Amazon, and we've also included a link in our show notes today. You know, if you check out our bookstore online, you'll find other missionary biographies by going to cmda.org slash bookstore. The legacy Dr. Rebecca Naylor is leaving for the next generation, it's such a wonderful example for all of us about what it means to truly live on mission for God's kingdom, accomplishing His purposes and His priorities. For those of us who have a relationship with Jesus Christ and have the privilege of being called into health care, our question should not be if we are living on mission, but rather where and how we're doing it. Wherever you are in your health care journey, we at CMDA have ways to help you be equipped to live on mission each and every day. If you have any questions about how you might get started on this journey, you can learn more through CMDA's Center for Advancing Healthcare Missions by going to cmda.org slash CAM, and that's spelled C-A-H-M. My conversation with Dr. Naylor this week, it reminded me about two very important upcoming events for our listeners who are considering following in Dr. Naylor's footsteps and becoming a long-term healthcare missionary. The first of those is CMDA's pre-field orientation for new healthcare missionaries. This year, it's scheduled for November 4th through the 7th at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. If you're planning to serve in medium to long-term healthcare missions, 
and you believe that you'll begin that service, God willing and enabling you, within the next five years, then this conference is designed just for you. Join fellow outgoing healthcare missionaries and veteran missionary faculty for four days of preparation for the field. I've had the privilege myself in teaching in this orientation over the last eight years, and I've had the opportunity to discuss with missionaries in training several real-life cases of medical missionaries that I experienced who were in crisis and how they dealt with that crisis successfully or maybe not so successfully. If you'd like more information and to register for that conference, visit cmda.org slash events. And if you attend that pre-filled conference, then I'm sure you'll want to stay a couple of extra days in Louisville for the 2024 Global Missions Healthcare Conference. This is an amazing celebration, as well as a gathering of healthcare professionals, students, and organizations who are dedicated to healthcare missions. That conference features breakout sessions, plenary speakers, exhibitors, and other special events. This year's event, which we call GMHC around here, is scheduled for November 7th through 9th at Southeast Christian Church. You can visit our CMDA website and uh, register by going to cmda.org slash events. As always, we plan on being back here with you next week with a new episode of CMDA Matters. You'll join Dr. Bill Griffin and myself for a conversation with Dr. Andre Chipta, who is the inaugural recipient of CMDA's Christian Academic Physicians and Scientists Research Fellowship Award. He's been studying the relationship between spirituality and health, especially the spiritual intervention of prayer with patients. So I invited him to share more about that project with Dr. Griffin and myself. I'm going to close with something that Dr. Naylor said early in our conversation that really stuck with me. She said, God spoke to me very clearly that medical missions was what he wanted me to engage in. I couldn't imagine that God could use somebody insignificant and small like me. I think that's such an amazing statement from a woman whom God made powerful and influential and a woman who made such a huge difference in the lives of thousands upon thousands of patients in India over her decades on the mission field. It's an incredible cameo of courage. This week, friends, let that be a reminder to you, no matter how small or insignificant we might think that we are at any given time, God has big plans for our lives and big plans for how we can be part of his work to bring the hope and healing of Jesus Christ to our world in healthcare. That's what matters to CMDA, friends. And CMDA matters. We'll see you next week, God willing. Thanks for listening to CMDA Matters. If you would like to suggest a future guest or share a comment with us, please email cmdamatters at cmda.org. And if you like the podcast, be sure to give us a five-star rating and share it on your favorite social media platform. This podcast has been a production of Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.